Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the Frontline Club um, for one of the uh, increasingly frequent discussions that we're having about Afghanistan. Uh, and today we've got a very distinguished panel indeed. Um, I should introduce myself, the least distinguished member of the panel, Sam Kiley. I've been working in Afghanistan for a long time and recently published a book about the war in Helmand. But um, to my left is uh, Gretchen Peters, who, who uh, lived and worked for many years in the region in Pakistan. Uh, and is the author of Seeds of Terror, How Heroin is Bankrolling the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, the title speaks for itself, uh, but um, as you will discover, the, uh, what she's got to say and some of the detail that she has been managed to flush out, uh, which has eluded our political classes and some of the people doing the strategic thinking on both sides of the Atlantic, is pretty shocking. Uh, Robert Shaw is the uh, director of the uh, Longbow Solutions. He is an expert, and this is a term I'm afraid that is now familiar to us all, on IEDs, improvised explosive devices, among other things. Um, he is currently involved in uh, training NATO troops in how to avoid and uh, indeed uh, occasionally dismantle the um, these weapons which are being used by the enemy forces in Afghanistan to increasingly lethal effect. Um, sadly, today, uh, four, new, uh, four more British troops uh, have been killed, and an IED operator, a guy who was a, a bomb disposal guy, was killed just three days ago in Helmand, uh, dis disabling his 65th bomb. Um, almost all of the casualties in Helmand over the last uh, 18 months have been as a result of <coughs> improvised explosive devices. And then we've got Horia uh, Masadik, who is, and I'm afraid, I'm ashamed once again that we only have one Afghan voice uh, on a panel about Afghanistan. Uh, but she's a human rights worker and very distinguished uh, researcher in that field. Now, human rights workers tend to get it in the neck from all concerned, on every side. You know, it is, it is possibly the most benign and therefore the least popular job in Afghanistan. Um, and particularly given the political developments that we've seen uh, over the last week, it will be very important to, to hear uh, her views uh, because, I mean, she, in a sense, like a bit like a medium, uh, will be channeling some of the views uh, from her compatriots uh, over actually in Afghanistan in, uh, during very, very tense time. Um, so I'd like to just sort of get the ball rolling. What I thought I'd do is, is, is we get each panelist, I'll get them sort of wrapping for a while, uh, and then we can uh, open it to the floor if that if that suits uh, everybody. Um, and I'd like uh, Gretchen, if you could sort of start off. The in this country, there's some considerable confusion as to why we're in Afghanistan. Uh, one of the reasons that was posited, it no longer is by the British government, but one of them was to get involved in drug eradication. Um, and um, that is a tough sell as a causus bellum uh, for the British. But I wondered if you could explain to us why the drug industry does matter, or indeed, if it matters. Uh, well, Afghanistan currently produces the largest um, narcotics crop that any single nation has produced in modern history since the Chinese Opium War days. This is the largest narcotics crop uh, in, in the history of the world. And uh, it is a tremendous cause of instability and insecurity, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iran and Central Asia, uh, and causes, as a recent UN report uh, put out, it actually causes more deaths in the UK. Uh, more British citizens die and more European more Europeans die every year uh, from heroin overdoses of Afghan heroin than uh, actually die on the battlefield in <coughs> Afghanistan. Does that make it worth it going to fight there? I, that's a um, you know that's another point. But there's no question that um, Afghanistan's uh, narcotics industry is a major driver, or is the principal driver of, in my opinion, of instability in that region, and um, it profits. Um, well, uh, the drug industry and, and the other related smuggling, uh, and I should say there's, uh, Afghanistan is a place where there's a phenomenon of, and it's not alone in this, Colombia and other places are like this, where drugs go out and commodities come, are smuggled back in, cooking oil, tires, vehicles, uh, all sorts of things. The Taliban, as the various factions of the Taliban, as well as other, as corrupt state actors, 
uh, profit and, uh, and protect that it, uh, illegal smuggling, both the drugs and the and the legal commodities that are smuggled illegally, and uh, there has been this almost complete denial of that as we try to strategize what to do in Afghanistan. That we're essentially functioning as a, uh, trying to fight a war within this enormous, ginormous um, criminal. Uh, trade that is, and there's a very small number of, of players on um, who, who profit most from it, and that gives creates a perverse incentive for them to stabilize Afghanistan. I think until that's at least under once we, you understand that, you can start to come up with new ways of looking at how to stabilize the region. So de a destabilized Afghanistan is a central precondition for being a successful drug dealer. Yes, or a successful or, or a powerful warlord in a province that drugs move through. I mean, you make an enormous, uh, one stands to make an enormous amount of money as a, a district police chief in a place or a, or a border guard in a place where a lot of drugs comes out and, and legal commodities come back in. You have a perverse incentive to try and stabilize it if you're making millions of dollars every month. Uh, I mean, I, during the course of my report, my report, my book, and the report I'm working on now focuses on. Um, uh, the insurgency and how money moves between the insurgent networks, criminal money, and how it moves up the command chain within the insurgent networks. And I compare them now to, uh, they, they function, uh, the Taliban, the various factions of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Lashkari Jangdi, Lashkari Taiba, all of these groups that operate in the region, they, they're not like a traditional army. We're not fighting the Soviet army there. We're not fighting the Iraqi army. They're, it's much more like the Sopranos. I mean, think of, think of your favorite mafia movie. The way that these guys interact with each other, the way money flows upward through the command chain as opposed to coming from a central command down, flowing back down, that's the way these, sometimes they collaborate with each other, sometimes the various factions of the Taliban fight each other, but it's usually about money. And nobody talks about that. Nobody talks about the criminal aspect of, of, of this. And, and, uh, and what about uh, government structures? Are they, are they involved Government too? structures are similar. I mean, the, the way that money, corrupt money throws, flows through, uh, corruption money thr flows through the government systems in Afghanistan and Pakistan and to some, I didn't study Iran as closely. But certainly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, it, it, it flows in similar channels. And, and what's important in terms of corruption is that it's very hard to find people who aren't corrupted by this. There's so much money sloshing around. Afghanistan's drug industry is now considered to be worth somewhere in the range of $4 billion within Afghanistan. By the time it gets out of Pakistan, the 40% the that comes out of Pakistan, it's considered to be worth somewhere in the range of 15 to $20 billion in Pakistan. That which comes through Central Asia is another sort of, uh, I forget, somewhere in the range of $10 billion. No, I mean, these are all like ballpark figures, but they're huge. Uh, I, I mean, it's but it's a huge percentage of Afghanistan's GDP and, and Pakistan's GDP. It's, it's virtually impossible to, uh, not impossible, but it's, it's, um, it's very challenging to think of a way to fight the corruption. The money is so corrupting. So the, 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 it's the principal oil of corruption. I mean, by definition, money is, but I mean, it's drug money that is. Yes. In your yeah. view. Drug, well, it, it depends. There are certain factions of the, the, the Taliban in the south, in Helmand, where British troops are fighting, uh, are basically making their money off of drugs. I mean, I would say that was the largest chunk of money they get. They, they get money from uh, the pro protection racket. They get money from some kidnapping, although that's, that's a bigger gig in the, in the southern, southeastern part of Afghanistan. The Taliban and other group, uh, extremist groups that are allied with Al Qaeda make much more money off of kidnapping. A, a, a famous recent case is the one of David Rode, the New York Times correspondent, who I spoke to on the phone yesterday. Uh, the, he was never going to turn into Danny Pearl. He, they were never going to cut his head off. He was not kidnapped as a political statement. He was a financial asset to the Taliban. They thought that they were going to get somewhere in the range of $20 million for him, for his release, and possibly the release of some of their people. Kidnapping has, be, has changed from being uh, an opportunity to stick somebody in an orange jumpsuit and chop their head off in a video to a financial uh, system. In the, in the eastern part of Afghanistan, they smuggle gemstones, uh, timber, there's human trafficking, they smuggle in ancient antiquities, uh, and the insurgents and corrupt actors profit off of all of this uh, criminality. It's even worse in Pakistan. I would say in Pakistan, um, the, at least in Afghanistan, the insurgents are seen 
by some members of the public as driving out this for, these foreign invaders. And to that extent, they are they get some respect, although I, I wouldn't say they're particularly popular from my research and my experience. In Pakistan, they're just seen as thugs. And when you ask Pakistanis to describe the Taliban now, the TTP, the uh, the, the Pakistanis, Pakistan's version of the Taliban or, the, or some of the other groups, they will, people will actually wor use words like gundai and mujrim, which mean gangster, criminal. They don't, they don't refer to them as mujahideen or holy warriors anymore. They refer to them as gangsters. And that's what they are. And I think we need to start defining that, them that way. And while that, there, there are certainly challenges to trying to fight this enormous criminal empire that exists there, it also pre 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 presents opportunities for re-strategizing how you... And how, how, but how involved structurally are elements of the government? We hear mention often about Wali Karzai, uh, President Karzai's brother, as being a central figure uh, in the criminal enterprise of, of opium smuggling and indeed growing in, in the South. I mean, how far is this criminal organization or series of criminal organizations, how far does it reach into the government system, the Afghan government system? I think it goes right to the top. I mean, Ahmed Wali Karzai is a perfect example. He's not seen as somebody who specifically... The thing is, that the, um, at the top of the chain, you never find the guys who... You're never going to find Ahmed Wali Karzai driving a jingle truck full of dope down the highway from Kandahar to Chaman. It's just not going to happen. He's the guy that makes sure that the police officials in each point along the road, the customs officials at the border, are not going to look in the jingle trucks that he's sending down the road. He's the guy that coordinates all of that. He's the Al Capone. He's the Tony Soprano. And, and, and he's the one that protects them. And there are other people like him in other parts. I mean, allegedly, okay, he hasn't been tried. There's a wealth of, of information about him uh, and his involvement in the drugs trade that has not been properly analyzed. And when, um, I think when American intelligence, there has been this big paper, uh, an article in the New York Times last week saying that he's still on the CIA payroll. Um, in, the, in the American intelligence system, when you say you don't have evidence on somebody, it means that the information that has been collected by intelligence agents has not been analyzed and turned into what they call evidence. They might have a huge amount of information, but until some journalist goes to them and says, what information do you guys have? And then still they don't have to answer the question. But they can claim they don't have evidence because they, there has been a refusal at top, top levels of, of, I believe, of the American intelligence network to uh, to analyze the information they have because they see him as an asset. And he presumably has a vested interest in uh, maintaining chaos in southern Afghanistan. Of course, so the because therefore he be remain Exactly. They're not pomegranates. Now, Robert, before we talk about the IED, you, you have personal experience at the sharp end of, of what corruption can do, the sort of corruption that is, that is uh, Gretchen's talking about on the, on the big scale. You actually experienced it um, at first hand. Could you just tell us how that came about? How did you end up in the nick? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> I was working for a UN project to do with um, DDR. DDR, um, you better. Sorry, yeah. The, um, it was basically integrating uh, former opponents of the regime into the political process by getting them to hand in ammunition and weapons um, and then rehabilitating former combatants, training them, and so on. Um, and then getting them back into mainstream politics uh, and society as a whole. Um, a lot of that project was also, in a sense, large-scale cleaning up of all the ammunition depots and sites that are around the country that had been um, demolished by coalition air power um, and were obviously not guarded and were open to be used by terrorists and, um, and locals who actually take the ammunition apart and sell it for scrap, uh, take off the copper driving bands and stuff like that and burn the propellant on fires. Um, and ultimately, uh, during that project, I realised the, um, the, the sense that the whole project itself was run by a lot of ex-military officers, which is fair enough, but none of them were actually UD, and they were running an UD project. Um, and they These are British and Western military officers? No, uh, mostly from developing countries, right. to be honest. There was a few Brits there, but 90% the, the of it was actually the UN developing countries. Paid for by the UN? Yes, absolutely. Paid for by the Brits. Actually, Japan and Britain are the two main donors, and Norway is the third largest. But um, a lot of it was subcontracted out to humanitarian demining organizations, which were sort of sloppy at best and downright criminal at worst. Um, there was an average of several deaths a month. And because they were local Afghans, they were sort of overridden and ignored and blamed on the Afghans rather than on the, the technical um, standards of the Western 
de humanitarian organisations. Um, and what I discovered was there was an element of kickback from people that had the contract, the de humanitarian organisations that had the contract with the uh, with the UN project. Um, and as it was, one of the uh, project officers, an Albanian, who um, who had basically done a NATO Anno Stormans course. Um, and then presented himself as an EOD officer, if you like, a technical trained guy, had been stealing ammunition from Kairabad um, ammunition depot, taking it to his hotel room, and then rendering it inert to sell to journalists as souvenirs um, and to uh, security companies as training aids, because a lot of them would have courses being run, uh, like, you know, sort of demining and so on, so that is quite expensive training. And a lot of the inert ammunition is six times more expensive than the real item. So um, they, these guys would make it inert and then sell it to. Um, training companies like Armour Group and so on and Global. And what, uh, what happened was the guy actually detonated a device in his room, uh, an old Soviet mortar bomb. Um, luckily for him, actually partially exploded rather than fully detonated. Um, blew his hotel room out into the street, into the car park. <laughs> and, um, and subsequently, um, during the course of the Afghan investigation by the NDS, um, my boss basically gave them my name. Your boss, who was a Brit? My boss was a Brit, ex Royal Marine. Not that I hate the Royal Marines at all, but uh, <laughs> you know. But ultimately, yeah, he gave my name in, um, claimed that I was mad and found wandering the streets of Kabul, um, that I'd blown him up over a sort of a, an argument at work, which was not the case. Actually, he was the, in a sense, out of all the officers there, he was the most technically inept, and I'd praised him on all my reports. He was the only one actually doing a good job, but then I didn't know he was stealing ammunition as well. Um, so ultimately, I ended up doing 40 days uh, in the NDS prison in the centre of Kabul oh, before really? being negotiated in uh, by the end. Yeah, which was never. So uh, this was an example of a, <laughs> of a corrupt Western official taking kickbacks, or offering, you know, getting the contract and paying kickbacks and receiving kickbacks yeah. with a government-funded uh, project, yeah. and you ending up in the um, secret yeah, policeman's jail. Yeah. I mean, you've got to bear in mind a lot of it with the UN um, wasn't always in sense of intent to be corrupt. Um, they were just completely inept in the sense of a lot of the, um, the, the developing countries' officers there. They weren't qualified on EUD, but they, it was very much the, the gravy train, you know, and they very much were, were quite openly. Um, what would happen is one would come in, be put in a, a place of um, sort of command or management, and then he would deliberately, in a sense, mismanage everybody. So the Westerners would get fed up, due, again, due to technical standards, and they would leave. And then he would employ his nephew. He would own the device. And so what I found is a lot of, um, a lot of them were related within the projects. And they say none of them were, in a sense, EOD qualified. And none of them in either would When you say, I just should, should explain, EOD is Explosive Ordnance so. Disposal. So when somebody's not EOD qualified and they're in an EOD job, that means they're fiddling around with very, very large lumps of very high explosive. I mean, there are profound <laughs> terminal <laughs> implications to this. And, um, and what I found was, in a sense, the projects themselves um, extended themselves by messing it up. Um, and when I say that, a lot of it was large-scale logistic disposal of large stocks of old Soviet surplus ammunition, which there are obviously tried and te tested techniques for, um, and it has reduced a small amounts of metal. And what I found that um, a lot of the demining organisations, or the one that had the contract, and I won't name them, um, basically were deliberately, in a sense, not tamping their pits. So they were blowing the ammunition out, which A, made it more accessible to scrappers, children, who would run in and then blow themselves up on this uh, dangerous ammunition. But also the fact was they were extending their job constantly. So instead of a job taking six weeks, a technician six weeks, it would take four months and then nine months and then 12 months. Because they'd scat and, literally and scattered, they scattered it. it. So they ended up creating themselves more and more work to do. And they just got their, it all just paid for by the UN. So they just continually extended their job and took the money. Horia. And it could have been done in a sort of nine weeks, really. Yeah, you may not know uh, that particular story, but, but does this sound familiar in terms of the, you know, the Western role in Afghanistan before we get to the to the to the drug issue but in terms of how the, the western efforts in Afghanistan which are not all corrupt but i mean how are they perceived by by you the afghan people yeah i believe uh, many afghans <clears throat> they can definitely see a big difference they can see like uh, devil standards uh, they can see that how there are extra protective measures for the foreigners rather than for Afghans. 
extra luxury lives for the foreigners than for Afghans, and how many that supposed to be used for the Afghans, and the many that international community is a, a kind of giving to the Afghan people is not actually receiving to the people who are in need. And when you, I mean, when I have worked in Kabul, there's been quite a good sort of party scene. I mean, how is that? <laughs> a pretty excellent party scene, frankly. Um, how is that perceived by Afghans? I mean, I, I, just anecdotally, uh, there are two clubs that have no Afghans on the door. I mean, you know, I haven't seen that since apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm, I really I don't know about that, but uh, but the population. How, but do, pe do people in Kabul see Westerners partying and? Uh, I do believe that ordinary people in Afghanistan they don't know how the foreigners are partying, and even they don't go to those areas where foreigners are living and partying and having restaurants or whatever. So it might be some high-profile Afghans, which I know one of those. Uh, places where it says no Afghans is uh, particularly where the ministers are going and they are mainly ministers who have been educated and lived and have dual citizenship. Oh, so they can wave their Danish passport and get in? It might be. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the much more serious problem about human rights because, you know, NATO have been there since 2001, you know, we're into our second round of elections, which of course have gone a bit pear-shaped, but Karzai is now being um, warmly congratulated by um, Washington and less warmly so by London. But um, has there been a material improvement? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm grasping at, at positive vibrations here. Uh, uh, is anything getting better? Uh, I do believe that uh, since the collapse of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, there have been enormous changes. It would be absolutely unfair if we say that there haven't been changes. Like when we look at Afghanistan right now, an ordinary Afghan dares to wish for a better future, which was almost impossible during the Taliban time. Like girls are back to school, women are back to work. We have free media, we have like tens of uh, TV channels, hundreds of radio stations, hundreds of publications that are working in Afghanistan and operating compared to the Taliban time with almost no TV, only two or three publications and one Sharia voice radio. And also when we are looking to the issue of the education, like uh, uh, more than six million children are back to school. Uh, around 30 to 35 percent of them are girls, and just compare it with the Taliban with almost less than a million children and no girl at all in Afghan schools. So there have been a lot of changes. And, uh, but at the same time, there are serious challenges, particularly human rights challenges are still remain uh, in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, after the collapse of Taliban in Afghanistan, many Afghans were really hoping that how the international community proce uh, promised in the Bonn Agreement that they are going to give Afghans a better hope and how Afghans can have their human rights maintained. So they were really hoping that at the same time Western countries can also look into the past human rights violations and simply remove the people who are having blood in their hands from the power, which unfortunately didn't happen. And it was well described by other colleagues that when you talk about corruption, when you talk about drug, when you talk about criminality, who are the people who do that? They are simply the same warlords, mujahideen groups, who are supported by the West in the 80s. Now they just change to be gangsters, mafias, and big drug dealers, and people that who I, I do believe that uh, we all know what, what, what's happening in the country. So what should we do about them? And you've got nearly 100,000 100, heavily armed foreigners there. I think at the time in uh, 2001, when uh, America was uh, a military invaded in Afghanistan, unfortunately, they didn't have any strategy. They didn't know what to do with Afghanistan. They didn't know what they want to gain at the end of the day for Afghanistan. And honestly, I do think that they have never thought that the Taliban regime will be abolished so quickly. It just happened within a month and a half. 
And I, I just describe it like in Afghanistan, what happens in the villages when you drive a car, dogs are running after the car. Afghanistan was like a car, and Americans were running after the car. And once the car stopped, they just didn't know what to do with that. Shall, I, his bite? Shall I bite? Shall I just go back? What, what should I do with that? And this is what happened with Afghanistan. And this is how it gave an opportunity for those criminals, for those people who are having a blood in their hands, to be part of the government. And for international community and for the Western government, it was much more to use Afghanistan as a success story and mm -hmm. just not to talk about the past, which, which is not true. They never <coughs> talk to the ordinary Afghans what we want to see. Do we want to see those people to be more than 50% of the parliament? Do we want them to simply just sit and forgive our blood and just say, OK, we forgive each other and no one should talk about the past? No, this is not what the Afghans want. And at the same time, being fed up with the current government, Afghans don't want to go back under the Taliban rule. Mm -hmm. This is a clear message that I get from every Afghan. What they really want from the Western countries, from the people from the countries that are engaged in Afghanistan, to have a clear strategy to deliver to the Afghans what they have promised. Would that include removal of these, these warlords and drug barons from the administrative structures of the country? Absolutely. I think uh, this is one of the issues that, like, Human Rights Commission and Afghan government has launched a transitional justice action plan. And one of the actions that are forcing for that is removal of the people with the human rights uh, abuse record to be removed from the power. And this is what Afghans really need, that this should happen. But there's at no least sign at of it, a is minimum. There? But there's no sign of it. No, unfortunately. And, and we really need uh, the international community and the foreign governments, particularly US, to push for this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like for a reappearance of someone like Dostum, having someone like Fahim as vice president with Karzai is simply sending a wrong message to the mm -hmm. Afghan people. Gulaga, Sayaf. Yeah, we of can course. keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Dostum, uh, for those of you in the audience who pro don't know, I, I probably he's a pretty much a household name. Uh, one of his favourite tricks was to drag, drive tanks over the uh, over his over enemies. Over the skulls of his enemies. Yeah. Um, and last year he got drunk and killed about four family members, didn't he? He got he drunk and kill. he got up he onto his roof. Them. Oh, he beat them up. Yeah. Oh, he didn't kill them. Yeah. Uh, well, he's getting on. You know, he's an old yeah. man if, now. If, if they were not stopping, he might have. <laughs> <laughs> um, how are we doing for time? Well, we, I think I should open the floor, uh, <coughs> open the, the debate to the floor. Um, if anybody's got any questions, please um, put your hand up. Oh, and also, this is being streamed on the interweb. Um, so if you'd be kind enough to speak into that um, large black sex toy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that would be marvellous. Um, <laughs> questions, anybody? Don't be shy. Yes, sir. Um, is the Afghan war winnable, in your opinion? Whatever that means. I think I'll go last on that one. <laughs> Gretchen, is it winnable? Um, I think um, it is um, uh, certainly possible to um, um, stabilize Afghanistan and um, drive out uh, insurgents and um, corrupt state actors. I think the people of Afghanistan um, really want that and um, have shown remarkable uh, resilience and actual courage to come out and um, uh, vote in the recent election to. Um, uh, to support and, and in some way, in some ways, cooperate with with the increase of the Western troops that have already moved into places in the south that are very unstable. Um, I, I survey uh, poll after poll shows that Afghans want. Um, I often hear the argument from from so-called experts 
usually people who have never left Washington, um, that Afghanistan is ungovernable, that it's never been governed. Um, and that's not the message I hear when I go to Afghanistan's villages. People tell me they want security, they want schools for their girls and their boys, they want health clinics. It's the same thing, that, and they want jobs. The same things that all of us want everywhere in the world. I don't think there's anything particularly unique or different about the Afghans. They've just had 30 years of civil war. And um, as um, Horaya said, we, uh, the Western governments have been propping up the same corrupt warlords for, for going on three decades now. And we wonder why they're not doing a better job at governing the place than they were two decades ago. It's, it's hard to expect they're going to improve. Um, yeah, I mean, you're talking about people who drive tanks over the heads of their enemies. I do think uh, there's an extremely flawed um, administration there. And I also actually think that the whole structure of the Afghan government is, is flawed. And I don't know, I don't specifically know what to do that about that. The Bonn Agreement created a presidential system for Afghanistan. It gave an enormous amount of power to the president. Uh, and that's not the kind of structure Afghanistan has typically had for its government. Uh, at the same time, I do believe, in theory, the country could be, could be stabilized. But uh, our uh, Western forces that are there, I believe, are, are dangerously mistrained or untrained for the type of enemy they're fighting and the type of war that they're engaged in. And that's not only turning the public against them and leading to uh, enormous and unnecessary amounts of civilian casualties, it also means they're not actually getting to the bad guys. In fact, as, um, as Sam and I were talking about before, they don't even have any idea who the bad guys really are. Uh, in most places, if you speak to the intelligence units who are at the local level in Kandahar and Helmand and Kunar, they've got no freaking idea who they're actually fighting. It's that actually, it's actually that bad. So in theory, yes, this could happen. Is it going to happen the way things are currently going? I don't think so. Robert, you're a man with a military background. Um, can we win? No, I don't believe so. The, the Afghans are a very proud nation. They've always, in a sense, been standalone. They've resisted every invader that's come in in the past. Um, and again, that quote, they've never been uh, governable outside of Kabul. Um, that is true. In a sense, if, as what Gretchen said, if we provide um, a completely retrained Afghan army and it holds there, then in a sense, long term wise, it might be. The reality is most Afghan families I met had one brother in the ANA and one brother in the Taliban. And they were just waiting to see which side won. Um, so they were hedging their bets against both. Um, but that doesn't make it unwinnable. It just no, it, means it doesn't make it unwinnable. Clever. But the other thing I found, I worked inside C-Stick Alpha, who's the um, American HQ for redevelopment and training the Afghan forces. And they had these great whiteboards, uh, whiteboards on the wall with all the little checklists that they had. And the idea was, was that we've got to tell Washington we've done our job so we can get out of here as soon as possible. So they would come in every day and say, we issued them radios. Yes, tick. Have they got boots? Yes, tick. Have I trained them to do EOD? Yes, tick. And what they do is they send two National Guardsmen out who weren't EOD, who were chefs, who got a PowerPoint presentation, gave it to the Afghans, six hours worth of PowerPoint because they can't read and write, and said, OK, you're EOD guys, off you go, train. And that was the same for, in a sense, every single branch of the trade. All they wanted to do was check the boxes they could say to Washington, we've done our job, get us out of here, let's go. Because they were very much under political pressure and cost financial costs to get out of there. If you, had, if you had a committed regime that could say, we'll do it properly, and we, we'll give it the troops, and we'll give it the money, and we'll spend 10 years training the ANA to do their job, then yes, it's winnable. But the reality is, politically, you're never going to get that. Neither the money, nor the commitment to stay, nor the troop levels required. And as you said, the, the troops, at the end of the day, they can't train for the war. They train for a war, because they've got more than one job to do. And they might be required to go somewhere else afterwards. So there is a big, um, mm. in a sense, both in the US and the British Army, there is a big argument at the moment. All the courses that are done, regardless of the trade or the job, you know, do we train for the war? Do we train for a war? And some of the training establishments have switched to the war, and some of them still stay the war. And there are justifications for both and disadvantages to both. And until, in a sense, there's a united effort on that. But in a way, I don't think we can afford to focus on just that campaign, because next week, we might be somewhere else. And therefore, you must have trained for the war, which will never make you horribly efficient at fighting the war. You, you just take the principles and have to get on with the job in hand based on the local circumstances. They don't get enough cultural training. I think there's a lot of, in a sense, you, they do know who their enemy is. But the problem is, their enemy can be a hardened Taliban fighter at one end. It can be a narco 
criminal the other, and he could be the farmer that you've just cut down his tree to open a field of fire mm. outside of your patrol base. And under, obviously, Afghan culture, wants some sort of reparation for it. And if we're not briefed, we don't have the money, or we don't understand it, he'll quite happily sit there and take pot shots from his roof. Doesn't make him a terrorist, it just makes him an angry and annoyed Afghan. But when you're taking it, you see it as all the same. And you're mm. quite happy to spend a £22,000 missile to destroy his house. Obviously, with him in it, you can get away with it. So I, I personally don't think it is, and with a, unless there's a lot more commitment, politically Maria? and financially. Yeah, I do believe a long-term commitment makes a lot of difference. But at the same time, what makes Afghans confused and why we are, instead of improving, we are just falling back and every day the security is getting bad? Because people of Afghanistan are getting mixed messages. Mm -hmm. From one hand, the international community is encouraging Afghans, and we are here to fight Taliban, we are here to fight Al-Qaeda. And from the other hand, they are saying that, oh, we are here to uh, negotiate with the Taliban. OK, maybe with light-minded Taliban. Who are light-minded Taliban? If they are light-minded, why they are Taliban? Right. <laughs> So of course, people are absolutely confused. Shall I fight? And then tomorrow, that person who I fought with is part of the government, and then he's a district governor. He's going to kill me and my family. <coughs> with such a mixed messages, they are making their life difficult and our life difficult. I do believe that not only a long-term commitment, but at the same time, clarity on the strategies. What do we want to gain at the end of the day? What are our objectives? And how do we want to le really help Afghan people? If, if they don't have uh, any clarity, I, I don't think that they are going to win. And at the same time, the bigger concern for the Afghans are that we don't want to fall into another civil war. We have experienced 30 years of war. We are not different from you people. We love our children. We love our family members. We love our country. We don't want to see further bloodshed there. And we want to put an end. So this is why it's so important for us, and also for you, to support us for a long term, uh, with a long term commitment to have a better Afghanistan, a peaceful Afghanistan, and also to make your country safe. Mm -hmm. Can I add a Yeah, yeah, please do. What I found was um, that inside the government, um, we were quite happy in a way, and, and this is nothing against the Americans in the sense of they're struggling to redevelop not just the armed forces but all the other ministries. Um, and one of the reasons is because they've imported a lot of, in a sense, uh, educated Afghans from foreign countries that, um, that left, obviously, when the Soviets invaded. And so, in the sense, they're the only ones with an education and capable of, of producing the goods as a minister. The drama is, I found, that their, their, uh, their authority didn't exceed their office walls because their staff are the Afghans who stayed during the Soviet invasion. And so their view was, who do you think you are? I stayed here and struggled and ate rice and had the Soviets, you know, kill my family. And then you went, you bummed off to Australia or the States, you got a degree, and then the Western powers have put you in charge. And so ultimately, there was always that friction between them. And Afghan culture, again, it's all about the family and the tribe. And um, if, for example, the US Army, they gave the MOD six months' worth of wages for the troops, and in this case, I'm talking about the troops that guard the ammo depots, because they gave them the money so they could get paid, because they hadn't been paid in six months. And the Afghan general just put it in his safe and kept it, which then meant the guards, being unpaid and didn't even have sort of fuel for fires, sold the ammunition, potentially to terrorists, to make money, so they could actually just so they could feed themselves and burn firewood. Not because they really cared whether the Taliban blew anybody up with it or what the Western powers were doing. It was simply a case of self-survival. So um, there's a lot, in a sense, of obstacles culturally to overcome. The Afghans have always operated as a family and as a tribe. So whereas we would see it, were well, you putting that money in your safe is corruption to Western standards? It's not. It's just the Afghan way of life. It's how they operate. They'll look after their own family first and employ them in a job rather than somebody necessarily that's qualified for it. But that, you know, here we call it the establishment. On, on the ground. <laughs> it's not so different. Yeah, and at the same time, I wanted to mention your very well pointed that issue. And that because since 2001, the international community has put much more efforts and focus on military gain and mm. on military search. And they absolutely forgot the other aspect, which is the development and humanitarian. 
so much money is going into military uh, expenses, and I don't know if I'm not uh, mistaken, it's like more than 100 million US dollar is only spent for one day expenses of uh, US military forces in Afghanistan. So if similar amount of money is spent on development, on humanitarian, and on creation of job, I'm sure that we were we will be in a different position in 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 few years. Well, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, certainly the, the the expenditure has switched to military means, but the reason being is you can't have the development without the security that's provided that comes through the military. Otherwise, you go into a village in Helmand, you you can you know build a school. The Afghans absolutely love it. You can give them all the aid. But if you, you can't, you're not going to have to dominate the ground. Helmand. You walk away, and the <laughs> Taliban come and can burn it to the floor and kill the teacher. So yeah. without the security and the money being spent on that first, you'll never have the long-term stability to put the development into place. One of the other things about costs is that we're not just, in a sense, paying, you know, buying more bullets or buying more armoured vehicles or more helicopters. The, we didn't just turn up to Afghanistan, put a camp on the ground and say, this is British sovereign territory, this is ours. We rent every single f square foot mm. of ground that we hold at exorbitant prices by the Afghan landlords. Camp Suta in Afghanistan, uh, in Kabul, which is no more than a company strength camp, costs a million pounds a month. So I hate to think what Camp Bastion costs, which is like 50 times the size. So ultimately, that money, in a sense, is being spent by the MOD, not in a sense of it's being just put onto Mitchell, it's going back into the Afghan economy. But what you've come back to the again. owner of that, of that money. But what it doesn't matter. Do foreign for you know. Once again, you come back to Gretchen's. You know, or well, at least my what a takeaway thought from Gretchen's fascinating analysis, which is that there are large groups, significant financial incentives to, to underwrite to keep it unstable. Yeah, to keep it. You know, there's very few people other than the Afghan majority, but nobody in power has much of an interest in stabilizing Afghanistan. Well, I wouldn't even say unstable, but just to keep in the sense of the power base as it is. Mm -hmm. That could pro -co not necessarily unstable. Well, which is unstable. They always generate. Problems. You can't, you know, if, if you've got. Just to keep the money can, coming. Perhaps we could ask, uh, yes, sir, on the, at the back. Thanks. Uh, two questions that can be rolled into one, I guess. Um, in the earlier stages of the presidential election, um, there were some suggestions that uh, the recent history of, of the country suggests that um, in relation to uh, Karzai, he was the natural man because there'd only ever been a Pashtun leader of the nation and that Abdullah Abdullah therefore wasn't a real runner because he wasn't a Pashtun. And, and secondly, uh, the other aspect of the question is, um, are we uh, really pushing, banging our heads against a brick wall in trying to impose a, a Western developed nation one nation, one government approach onto a country that seems pretty destined to remain uh, a collection of tribal fiefdoms. Can I ask Korea, as the only Afghan on the panel, did you, did you, could you catch that? It was slightly inaudible. But I think the, 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 the gentleman was saying um, that it was a pretty hopeless notion to have um, a non Pashtun president, firstly, and secondly, what is the point of trying to impose democracy on a country that is so kind of naturally fractured, in his view, by, by the tribal loyalties, or ethnic loyalties, should I say? I, I think, yeah, in Afghanistan, of course, uh, I, I think it, it needs lots of political analysis, but I think um, when I, as an Afghan, look into the whole electoral process, uh, I think that Karzai was a winner. But I don't know why the whole issue of the corruption and everything came out. And uh, because simply he got like the majority of Pashtun supporting him, and even some Tajiks are supporting him. And it's uh, I don't think that it, it yeah. But so we need to is what I can, Yeah, I, this is what I can really say. But by an election, he had already won. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, about the issue of the democracy, I. I don't know. My analysis is quite different, and I b do believe that democracy doesn't know any uh, geographical boundaries. And even what you have now is because of the sacrifices that your grandparents has given. You are not a democrat nations maybe a couple of hundred years ago, but this is how your 
uh, grandfathers and mothers sacrificed, and this is what you're enjoying now. So uh, I also do believe, as an Afghan, as a woman, that uh, change will not come by itself. You should impose the change. Great, and you wanted to. Well, I wanted to say that right. I think, uh, well, first of all, um, I, I, Dr. Abdullah is half Pashtun, so he just, as a, he's not a Tajik entirely. But um, uh, I think there was this widespread expectation in the West and also among many Afghans and Pakistanis that <clears throat> Afghanistan would go to bed one night, Afghanistan, after the Americans and, and, and the rest of the world invaded, and the next day wake up Switzerland. And um, this is a society that has been incredibly shredded by three decades of war. Uh, the lack of uh, education, which we've talked about, the lack of health care, um, the, the um, uh, you know, police forces that, uh, that are, um, I mean, in a lot of areas, this is really, um, uh, the, the, the problem is a lack of, of rule of law. There's no law and order. And um, there's been this massive effort to try and train up the police force, which turns out to be very difficult in a place where 80% of the village level police officers are illiterate. How can they write a crime report? How can it go to the local court? If, is there even a local court? Probably the county prosecutor's been knocked off by the local drug dealer. It's extremely hard to get this stuff started again, and it's not going to happen overnight. But it's definitely not going to happen if the strategy is it ignores all of those aspects. If we just say, OK, we'll send people out to do a three-hour PowerPoint with an EOD team by people who aren't even trained to do EOD, there has to be um, a recognition of what we're expecting the Western forces, the, the civilians and the soldiers, to go in and do. They, there has to be a clear strategy, and there isn't. But one thing that I think we could do a lot better is listen to the Afghans about what they want. Every time you see people uh, new, for example, in the recent stories that come out as, as more Western forces push into village areas in the south, in Helmand, and Kandahar, and uh, Farah, and uh, Nimroz, they go into these villages, they sit down with the tribal elders, they say, we're going to build a population strategy, we want to take care of you. And they say, okay, help us build some wells, help us fix our irrigation canals, provide security, give us some jobs, and if you can do all of that, we'd also, by the way, we'd also like a school. They're not asking for a shopping mall and a Starbucks. It's pretty simple. And nobody's giving it to them. There are all of these elaborate plans to try and have um, to, to try and do these crazy development projects, and the Afghans are actually, as a first step, just to get their trust, asking for fairly simple things at the village level. And as far as I can work out, that is very rarely delivered. I do think, in some cases, it is. I'm not trying. To, I'm not knocking the effort that um, our militaries are doing, and I think the Americans and the British and the Canadians are, are doing by far the most heavy lifting uh, in all of this. But um, there is a tendency to ignore what it is that the villagers actually want and to ignore the fact that Afghanistan was relatively governed. It, it wasn't centrally governed. There was a weak king and a fairly powerful, uh, I mean, tribal, tribal rule through, up, through, um, up until almost, up until the well, 1970s. Until the Soviets, yeah. Um, but there would be a routine, you know, regularly the, the, the tribal leaders would meet in the loya jurgas, which basically means big meeting, and they would decide how things would go. Anybody who's ever been, I mean, I've spent years going to loya jurgas at the village level, uh, and in, in many ways, at least if you're a bloke, it's actually quite a democratic process. I mean, you sit there for hours. Every last guy can stand up and give his point of view, and everybody has to listen to it. It's, it's a, I actually think Afghanistan is fundamentally, as long as you're a guy, fairly democratic. There Fair are enough. things that need to change in that regard, Here I believe. Or there. Huh? <laughs> but but, but it, I do think this is a country that, that has, that has a, a, a traditional government structure, that, that it, and it functions relatively stably when that's functioning. We, the West has come in with the bond agreement and imposed a system of government that doesn't work there. And we have and we've tried to go in and set yeah. up police forces and judiciary forces that ignore the traditional systems of government that Afghans had. Was to that make your experience, work. Robert? Very much so. Yeah, yeah. The, the Afghans, in a sense, you know, they they have their system, their way of working. It's existed for two thousand years. We're relatively newcomers in a democratic system. 
who are we to turn up and say this is the best way for you? Mm. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm quite happy with the democratic system in the UK. I'm not about to become a hardline communist. But at the end of the day, does it really work for the Afghans? No. They are very much. But if I, if I, I sorry, I'm going to cut you both off because I, I mean, I've spent my, most of my life in post conflict, well, all of my working life in conflicts or post conflicts, a lot of them in Africa. And you hear, it's not just Afghanistan, the question you pose, you hear all the time from Africa, why do we try and impose our Western ideas of democracy on this ethnically divided nation? My own country, Kenya, has 47 different tribal languages. In every single case, and this is also my experience in Afghanistan, people get democracy. You know, human beings are not brain dead. No. One man and woman vote one vote is a very, very easy concept to get across. And in every single case, they already have democratic structures in their traditional, in the Shura process or the Indaba, whatever it is. There is no natural tendency in tribal societies towards dictatorship. No. What you've got is shitty leaders. Yeah. And as Haraya said, we continue to support them. We don't investigate them, get rid of them, use the international structures, the Hague, the International Criminal Court, et cetera, et cetera, to take these people Kill out. Kill them. Well, I, you know, if I'm you, if you want to teach me to use a gun, I'll go and kill them myself. Yeah, I'm saying go, you know. the, they can be, need to be <laughs> taken off. They squad. need to be taken off the, the playing field. Yeah. They need to, there needs to be interdiction, one way or another. And um, I think the Afghans, um, uh, my experience from, 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 from uh, you know, the work that I've done and the, uh, is that that's, that's what people want is to get well, they feel very just, small do, set of do, bad do guys. Feel, I mean, but 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 our. We talk a democratic game in Afghanistan, but we don't deliver the Afghans a democracy, do we? No, yeah, I think. Uh, so, I mean, that I, is a betrayal. I, I mean, the Afghans are standing there going, you know, <laughs> it's not what it says here. Yeah, I think uh, I'm just giving you some uh, examples. Like, I, I just returned back from Afghanistan last week. And when you talk to many Afghans there, like, I do believe that in 2002, 2003, when I was talking to the police chiefs or uh, prison commanders or someone, they were too scared to admit that if they have committed any torture and if they torture the prisoners. But right now they are loudly saying, yes, I did torture, but I did not sexually abuse as it happened in Abu Ghraib. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so, yeah. Unfortunately, these are sending the wrong messages. As you said, like what we, when we talk about democracy, but when we do not deliver it, it simply can send the wrong message. And this is why people of Afghanistan really need to see good examples and also some level of uh, being committed to what we say or, or we, what we see, do we believe in that? Like, I, I, I think for the past few years, it was always at the top of the, I think, international slogans that you were talking about nation building and the state building in Afghanistan, we are all the nation building, we are all the state buildings. This is what people of Afghanistan are asking. Yes, madam. You may have to throw it. Uh, two questions, if I may, uh, for Gretchen. Um, this so-called list of 50 names uh, of drug barons. Could you give us a bit more background on that, please? And Huria, um, given that maybe the military solution is not the best option, would it be a solution to have a lawyer jaga? Uh, the 50 names, uh, and I don't know whose names are on it, but from what I know about it, it is a, a list of 50 uh, people who um, 50 individuals who, who um, work at the operational level to support um, heroin and opium smuggling from, uh, by and large, from the south, from Helmand, Kandahar, Nimroz, Farah, uh, Orizgan, Orgun. Uh, and when I say operational, I mean the, the people driving the trucks with the drugs, the people running drug labs. Um, these are lucrative positions, but one of the things that I always argue is that um, uh, and I should say that, as, as I understand it, and I haven't seen the list, um, the, uh, as I understand it, that list is only traffickers, or uh, that's, uh, th that list is traffickers who work with the Taliban. In other words, that's not the guys who are driving jingle trucks for Ahmed Wali Karzai. And so, to me, there's two problems with, with 
the existence of that list. And I actually think people like that should be considered. Uh, they are they are valid um, targets of the war, in my opinion, and, and some people disagree with that. But in my opinion, if if they are uh, supporting insurgents who are planting bombs that are killing civil Afghan civilians and uh, killing Western troops, then they are valid targets of war. Um, uh, but. Uh, there also has to be an effort, an equally sustained, I mean, uh, invigorated effort to go after traffickers who, on the operational side who work with corrupt state actors, uh, whether it's members of the Karzai clan or um, other uh, drug traffickers around the country. The, uh, where it doesn't do the international community any good to be fighting one set of criminals and to be seen supporting another set of criminals. I don't see us as getting anywhere in Afghanistan or Pakistan or, uh, if, uh, or Central Asia if we do it this way. But, but more importantly, another message I think gets lost in all of this is that drug smuggling is um, the actual physical smuggling of drugs, no matter where you go, is only one side of the equation. The real money in drugs is not actually in the drugs. It's actually in the money. The place where you stand to make the most money is laundering the money. And there's almost no effort. And there's still, I think, a complete misunderstanding of, the, um, of how the money laundering system works and the huge amounts of money that are coming back to major um, influential and well-known um, businessmen, particularly, and, and, and very senior uh, people, in, particularly in Pakistan. We haven't even mentioned Pakistan, which is truly the skunk at the party in this whole <laughs> Afghanistan situation. Um, a lot of the major money laundering takes place in Pakistan and the UAE, another key nation that we haven't talked about tonight um, in all of this. Afghanistan's drug problem is not just Afghanistan's drug problem. A lot of the command and the control of it, the, the, the dope is grown there. It's processed in, in labs that are along the border. But the command and the control is in Pakistan and the UAE. And that rarely gets discussed. It's not just run by men in black turbans. There are also men in white collars. And they need to be interdicted as well. I'm not suggesting um, that we're going to start firing predator missiles into you know buildings in Dubai. Uh, but. In, in theory, but but neither Pakistan nor the UAE has shown much um, uh, co -op, uh, has proved to be particularly cooperative about handing over people who. And I know that that um, the U.S. government recently has requested the extradition of five traffickers at the at the business end of things who are uh, operating from in Pakistan territory, and that hasn't gone anywhere. Oh yeah, the, what was the? I think we'll lawyer Jurgen. Lawyer Jurgen. Ah, oh, the lawyer Jurgen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about the drug traffickers, interestingly, before the presidential elections, President Karzai has put into a presidential degree, and he gave a uh, like pardon to five well-known drug traffickers in Afghanistan who were jailed. Yeah. So this was also part of the presidential deals, unfortunately. Uh, I think it's really difficult to say that a lawyer jerga would be a solution because even right now, considering that how the tribal structure have been demolished during the Russia invasion and afterward, and even now when we look at how Taliban are targeting tribal elders, simply stamping them by being a spy or a religious leader, I don't think that we even will have a. Uh, representative Louis Jerga, and I don't think that it will be a real solution in long term for Afghanistan. So, uh, yeah. Keep working it through the sentencing. Yes, sir. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'll come to it. I haven't been looking Thanks. This I, I wondered if anyone could give any examples of successful development initiatives in the insecure areas that could be done successfully ahead of, ahead of military control. I was thinking of you know, examples of, of uh, immunization programs or mobile clinics, which you know, can't be blown up afterwards. But are there, are there any successful examples? And the other point here, question is, what might Afghanistan look like if there was total disengagement of ISAF? Um, Can I just have Robert? Because Robert, you were at the sort of delivery end of uh, some of this. What, what, what? Don't let me put words in your mouth. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Okay, the second question, what would it look like if ISAF pulled out? I think that's, in a sense, um, a 50-50 for several reasons. Um, when I talk to old Afghans in Kabul, they originally welcomed the Taliban with open arms. And the reason they did was because they'd had 30 years of civil war and couldn't go to the shop without being shot um, by the controlling warlords. So at the end of the day, they, they said quite openly, well, we welcome the Taliban because they promised law and order. They promised a sense of human security, which everybody needs. Um, and it was only then, once they were in power, their, their religious extremism then, in a sense, turned everyone uh, generally against them. Um, so it would be unfair to say that if we pulled out, the Taliban would take over tomorrow. Because, for example, you could, have, in a sense, have a, a disengagement by all of the main military forces, in a sense, but then sponsor the Afghans themselves, which is interesting, there was always that split. The Taliban, I don't think, ever controlled the whole country. There was always the Northern Alliance, um, which were used to obviously help oust them out. So, in a sense, as long as you supported them and paid them through intelligence channels or, you know, SF channels, then ultimately um, you'd not, it's not necessarily guaranteed that the Taliban would roll back in. I think it would really be down to the Afghan people and what they wanted. And I think the problem is, is that they, they do want the best thing. They, you know, they, they do like the security, they, like, they see the development. Um, and in general things, I think we do a sense of a wonderful job at a local level. Um, and they do appreciate it, they really do. And they, they want you there. But ultimately, like I said, the, the problem is, is that we can't give them enough commitment and guarantees that they honestly believe us. And so they are always on that, sitting on the fence waiting to see who's going to win and therefore really it would be down to the Afghans we could put out tomorrow and in a sense to be honest the Afghans could probably cure the problem themselves but we would call it genocide and we'd have an argument with it but in a sense nature's way of sorting the problem <laughs> um, with the stronger side wins at the end of the day the law of armed conflict so ultimately um, they might sort it out themselves but equally enough of them might sit on the fence and allow the Taliban to come back in because they, in a sense, they'd rather have a draconian state um, and have security <laughs> than have a non-draconian state and have insecurity where they don't feel safe going to the shop. So Marine, I think it's very much in the hands of the Afghans. What 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 can Western or what can aid organisations or the military? I think you. It's an either or yeah, question. It's no, yeah. not either or, but particularly you know civil organisations, you know, which are favour of the month. Reach out in the most unstable places. These are other things that they can do. I think, uh, unfortunately, after 2001, after the collapse of Taliban regime in Afghanistan, we are seeing that more NGOs and aid agencies are being targeted. And this is unfortunately because the aid have been militarized. <coughs> PRTs are doing the same job. NGOs are doing the same job. Who are these guys? There is a huge confusion. PRTs are the military provincial reconstruction teams. And uh, when they go with their military uniforms and they are building a bridge, and then a NGO goes and they are building a clinic, simply people are confused. And also, for the past few years, what happens, like wherever a country does have a PRT or a military presence, they are more supporting NGOs and aid organizations within those areas. So this is also another big issue. Like aid need to be neutral and free of any military engagement. So this is what's really the, at least I think that it would be a solution if we separate military efforts and uh, mm. humanitarian assistance. I mean, if I could interject, efforts. I mean, I just did six months on the ground in, in Helmand, and the short answer to that is not in a million years they will get killed the <coughs> second they set foot in any of those environments, instantly. Now, why? They get killed because there's a Taliban tactic of making sure that none of these, no, there's, there's no benefit to membership or participation in state structures. You know, that's why they kill teachers, that's why they kill foreign NGO workers, that's why they kill local NGO workers. And you can't, in any case, I mean, the, the, there's a constant debate about this within Whitehall. Why there's a constant debate completely beats me, but there is. You cannot, you know, you can't win hearts and minds through aid projects if there are bullets flowing up and down the road. And that is the situation in Helmand, that you get attacked either in the camp or the nanosecond you step outside the camp if you're a Westerner. You, you're, there's a proper, intense 
firefights going on all over the place. It is inconceivable. And you know, as soon as far as I'm concerned, as soon as Whitehall get that, that there's a fighting war on, and then once it calms down to a sufficient degree, you can start doing aid, aid work. And just a last thing, where, however, in those areas where uh, development work can't go on because it gets blown up by the Taliban, if there is security, organically economics comes into the business. And in Musakala, I had uh, dinner with the district commissioner, um, district governor, and we had Moroccan mangoes. You know, Pepsi's $10 a slab in Musakala. We can't step out and buy it, but it's getting through. And that's no whitewashed mosques and PRT projects. That's just economics. Sorry, I'm a mediator. I shouldn't be. It's mostly drug money. Uh, in fact, it's entirely drug money. Yes, madam. Um, when Obama first got in, there was all the talk about AFPAC, appointment of Richard Holbrook. Haven't really heard that much about it lately. Holbrook didn't seem to be doing much in the elections. Is the notion of AFPAC clubbing the two together, does it not work or is it important? What's your view on it? Um, my, my view is that I, I don't think the Obama administration has any idea what they want to do. And they're desperately trying to figure that out. Uh, in the next couple of weeks what their strategy is going to be. And there, is, uh, there are camps within the White House, particularly led by uh, Biden, what Vice President Joe Biden, who want to see um, uh, more of the focus put on, on Pakistan and stabilizing Pakistan, which, which in some ways I agree is, is vitally important. Uh, and yet at the same time, um, I'm not suggesting we invade Pakistan, certainly, but it's hampered by the fact that uh, whatever stabilization efforts are done in Pakistan will be done by the Pakistan government, the Pakistan military, uh, which sees India as the main threat to Pakistan and not the Taliban and Al Qaeda. Um, and uh, while that, uh, the public, I think the public's view of the Taliban and Al Qaeda is changing, and now many Pakistanis, particularly in the NWFP and increasingly in the Punjab, the country's most pro populous province, see the uh, uh, extremists as, the, as a much bigger threat than India ever was or could be. Um, uh, it, it's, not, it's not clear that that, that country is still sort of, the, the, I think the public opinion and where, the strategy that, that, that Pakistan wants to take is still, is still not stabilized. Um, I think we've, I mean, we've said, all of us have said this in different ways and with regards to different issues. Somebody has got to come up with a strategy. And given that the United States is putting the most uh, resources and troops and money into all of this, it's probably going to come down to Obama making a decision how he wants to do this and getting uh, other NATO nations and the Afghans and the Pakistanis on board. Uh, it's very disturbing to me that. Um, how many months into his administration we are, and they still haven't made a decision. I think that is, uh, ex is extremely disturbing. And I think in part, personally, I think uh, as somebody now who's lived in the region for, for, for over a decade, and now I'm ba back living in the US for the first time, um, it has a lot more to do with the fact that we are domestically engaged in this massive health care drama that uh, is getting more and more politicized by the day. Obama doesn't want to take on two things at once, two major issues at once. And I think as sad as that is, that is what it comes down to. Um, and, um, but, but with every week and every month that passes without a clear-cut strategy, are we going to do counterterrorism? Are we going to do counterinsurgency? And if we do either one of those, how are we going to do it? And are we going to equip our, our military forces, our civilian people, the civilian support staff, and the intelligence officials to actually do that. I don't think we're, we're doing either counterinsurgency or counterterrorism well in either of those countries. I'm going to um, keep moving on with the questions. Yes, you're at the back there, ma'am. Um, first of all, let me tell you that I was a little shocked to know, like surprised to know that um, Dubai or UAE has something to do with the, with the drug trade because I'm from Dubai and I never ever got to know about this. So I, though I've studied so much about it, I never ever happened to know this. Moving on, um, y you being an Afghani, uh, I want to know um, what was, what's your take on Abdullah Abdullah set, uh, stepping down 
and uh, Karzai becoming the president once again, once again giving false promises and teary eyes to the audience and not delivering as much. Um, what do you think, who should have been the, the best choice for you as an Afghani and how you feel towards it? And um, second thing, don't you think we are forgetting Bagram prison in the whole scenario somewhere? And what's your take on that? Gloria? It's a difficult question. I think among two wars, I don't have any choice. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't have anything to say about Abdullah or Karzai. But at the same time, I think uh, what was really important for many Afghans that they have taken the risks and they went to the polling centers and they voted regardless to whom they have voted. So having the participation of Afghans, it means that Afghans wanted to see a change. And again, regardless of who wanted to be the winner. There were huge problems. There were huge threats. But again, they went and they practiced their right to vote, and they voted. But looking into the whole issue of fraud and uh, of course, it was very much the issue of disappointment for many Afghans that how uh, their trust have been like put into such a way, and, and how their uh, hopes have been demolished. Honestly, when I was in Afghanistan just like a week ago, and when I was talking with many Afghans. They were absolutely disappointed to see how the frauds were happening. And it just happened under the nose of everyone, including the Western uh, you know, observers who never stepped into the polling stations to see what's happening. And this was one of the reasons that pe people were really disappointed. And at the same time, uh, they were really hoping that something good could come out of this. Pardon? Well, I think I think we. Uh, she's, she's answered that question. She can't choose between. Yeah, you know, for, for me as an Afghan, I, I'm telling you, I, I didn't vote for Karzai and I didn't vote for Abdullah. For me, none of them are my my candidates. So that's it. Yeah. There were some hands I saw uh, down. You sir, at the back. There. Um, what's your opinion about the McChrystal plan to surge forces uh, to Afghanistan? Um, and um, if Obama backs it, what do you reckon its chances of success are? Start with uh, Robert. Can, can we try and keep our answers a bit briefer? OK, absolutely. Um, well, first of all, in a sense, any senior military commander will want to um, increase his troop strength to dominate the ground which is, in a sense, at a tactical level, was the only way of beating the insurgency. Like we said, if you, if, you, if you come in and build a school and please everybody and then pull back, the Taliban come in and trash the place. So at the end of the day, you've got to have enough troops to actually stay there. So he's asked for a surge, which would, you know, would be common sense. Um, to be honest, in, in the, the big scheme of things, whether it would make much difference, it will make a difference at a tactical level, but strategically and over long term, whether it will enable the security exist all over the country, in a way, you know, to allow development to go forward and, and provide the sort of image that we want of Afghanistan, I doubt it. It's because we just don't have enough troops. None of the nations all pulled together. It's quite a large country, and the Soviet has never managed, and you know, with the size of their forces, it was about 140,000 at the time at its peak. Um, I just <coughs> no. It just as issue is you can dominate one area, even a province like say Helmand. If you flood it with troops, you could dominate it. But the Taliban are very quick are then just moving somewhere else. And a lot of the other NATO countries are not going to increase their troop strength. They are there on a very thin line, a very short leash. They come with a lot of their own operating procedures in the sense of, you know, we're happy to have them there as long as they're only A, training, B, delivering aid, and C, not getting shot at. <laughs> um, and even the chicken. Germans at the moment are on a very sticky wicket because their army, con their, their constitution actually allowed their army only to go abroad to deliver humanitarian aid. And they are now actually getting hit themselves in what was traditionally a very quiet patch, which is why it was given to them in the first place. Um, so they are now, you know, wavering on the old grounds of 
you know, this is beyond our remit. This is not what we signed up to. Going to cut you off there, Robert. Sorry, we pull keep out. it quick. Will a troop surge work? Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, I think finally that was really a good sign to see that a, a strategy and a point of view came out from a NATO commander. <coughs> and uh, McChrystal's strategy was definitely, it's not a perfect strategy, but at the same time, that's good that they have a strategy. So th 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 this is a good sign. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, development and security should go side by side. Only focusing on security, I mentioned earlier, will not solve the problem. They are simply com complementing each other. That's very much McChrystal, to be fair, that's very much McChrystal's argument. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, he's, and he's not making a separation yeah. of. Absolutely, yeah. This, this is, this is what we really think that it, it should happen. And at the same time, I think in the whole uh, issue of uh, a kind of uh, stabilizing Afghanistan, we should not forget the Afghan ownership and we should not forget engagement of Afghans themselves. And unfortunately, for the past few years, simply human rights or, uh, organizations, civil society bodies were totally ignored. And whatever is happening is the top level, government level, intergovernment level, and that's it. So yeah, as earlier mentioned, if we are simply sitting with ordinary Afghans and just listening to them what they really want, that, uh, that's what's going to happen in the country. Gretchen, Serge? I would say, um, uh, well, th uh, let me put it this way. Throughout my life, various men have tried to convince me that it's not the size of the wand, it's the magic and the magician. <laughs> and uh, I've come it's to believe... It's not true, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of people say that McChrystal is this incredible military commander, but if he doesn't have the size of the force that he needs to create, this what he's asking for, if you read his 60-page um, uh, paper, which I have done, is uh, to create stability, the, uh, to create security in village areas that are the most unstable, particularly, or, or not village areas, population centers that are that are unstable, so that regular aid and development work could could start happening again. In other words, soldiers shouldn't be doing this in the PRTs. They will, in some cases, have to, but basically, it, they should. Their work should be should be providing a secure environment so the regular development work that has always happened there could, could start to take place again. The problem I have uh, with the whole plan is that I don't think that enough troops, and this goes back to what Robert says about do you train for the war or do you train for a war. a war. I don't think that, and, and there's a tremendous divide I know among American commanders. Um, uh, in many ways, when you send a group of Marines, be they Royal British Marines or American Marines, to a village, in, whether it's Musakala or down in uh, Garamser or someplace like that, you send a company of soldiers down there. They are essentially policemen, aid workers, diplomats, and the company commander is the mayor. And they're not trained for it. They, they, if they're lucky, they have a couple of guys who speak a little, a smattering of Pashto, and they have good a good trans couple good translators if they're lucky and that's um, but my experience is that um, in most cases they uh, the intelligence training they receive uh, in terms of the intelligence guys that are in the unit the infantry training they receive is not for the kind of, of uh, community stabilization project that they're actually being assigned for I know when I, go, I do a lot of pr um, presentations with American troops who are about to deploy and I can tell you that young men who join the Marines don't join the Marines because they want to be a policeman in Helmand but that's what they're going to end up doing Basically, in my opinion, that is the work that they're going to end up doing. And until we train them for that, I think they're not. I, I think we send that number of troops properly trained, might work. Can I can I throw a comment in there? Yeah, Sorry. quick one. It was it was the commandant of the U.S. Marine Corps who wrote the uh, the three block war strategy, and said that all troops have to be trained from high intensity warfare to giving out humanitarian aid, and um, they are generally obviously trained in high intensity warfare first because it's easier to step down. But all troops, regardless of NATO countries, undergo pre-deployment training prior to going there, which gives them, in a sense, learning them to be a policeman. To a degree, what I would say is having undergone that training, the focus is very much on uh, you know, contact with the enemy, reaction to effective enemy fire and IEDs and the rest of it. Um, and, it, and the training teams that are there to develop the ANA and the ANP actually don't get specific training in that. 
the omelettes don't get right. trained. And that's what they're arguing for. The war fighting troops do get trained to do their job and they get trained very well. But admittedly, the culture, the culture aspect of it, which I would consider the most important, takes second place. Traditionally, we spent days on end training in high intensity fighting, and then the, the language and the culture lesson was 40 minutes at the end, when everybody was dog tired and fell asleep. So we literally, we missed it. You know, and then you went out there and was, and was supposed to engage with the local community. And the, I was going to make another... Sorry, I'm going to interrupt oh, you because I think we're going on a bit. Najib. Another Thank Afghan you. voice. I want to comment on, <coughs> on the discussion tonight. Can, uh, you, can you do it in the form of a question? I'm uh, trying to discourage comments from the floor. OK. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's quite wrong to uh, call the fighters or fighting NATO, label them under one name Taliban. I think they're not Taliban. They're different groups of insurgency. If you call them insurgency, that would be fair, because there's lots of Mujahideen from uh, Izbi Islami, Khaleh, Sheikh Matyar, and, and Harakat, and, and, uh, and it's, 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 they're not just Taliban. And I think it's uh, uh, quite wrong to you know, call them criminals or drug barons. And, and, and their ideology is only you know, because they, they are getting money out of the drugs, that's why. They see an opportunity. They, they are fighting NATO, but they see uh, you know, they don't want to create another enemy. The people who are, you know, smuggling drugs or um, <laughs> growing drugs, they do not want to make another enemy. So they pay, you know, getting tax. And actually, this is forgetting it was Taliban. I don't, I'm not uh, to defend them in any way or capacity. It's just, you know, I want to, because uh, they've been, you know, bashed and bashed. You know, it was actually Taliban who uh, brought uh, opium production and they lost there in 2000 to zero. And, and which they never, you know, sold praised, it the year later praised, for a profit. For. Yeah, and, <clears throat> and, 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 and I think the insurgency is not going to be, you know, be to the south, it's going to spread to the north, given that Mr. Abdullah, Dr. Abdullah's supporter, been, is very disappointed, and they're already given signals that they will prefer to join Taliban if Dostum is coming back to north. Mm. That's a okay. Okay, I'll let you. I'll let you off because it's a very interesting comment, <laughs> as always from Najib. Madam, in the green uh, top. Um, actually, it's uh, the lady to my left from the UAE. She asked about Bagram, but that wasn't answered. Um, could you give your opinion on um, how you think uh, Bagram Air Base and the detention centre there affects? Horia, human rights question. Yeah, uh, as. Uh a uh, human rights activist, as, an, as someone who works for Amnesty International, we have very quite clear uh, vision on that. We do believe that due process should be a, a kind of uh, implemented in the issue of the Bagram and Guantanamo uh, prisoners, and whether there should be, you know, there should be a fair trial, and everyone should be, they should know that what will happen at the end of the day, are we prisoners of war or not? And, you know, if, if they are prisoners of war, they should be, there should be a fair trial, and there should be also access of the human rights organizations. Even Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission does not have any access to the detainees in background. So this is the minimum level of request that we can put, and we can ask them that, you know, uh, there should be an access of the human rights organizations. Did you put that access uh, that question already? Yeah, we did. And we did. Else? I think uh, at least since 2002, there have been frequent calls by the Amnesty International, by the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, and by the other human rights organizations at internationally to have access to the Guantanamo and to background. But unfortunately, these. Uh, requests have been dropped out. And even for the Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, they are putting conditions, like the US Army were saying that, OK, but they should be, like, uh, when the delegation is going there, there should be someone from the uh, US Army with them, while they don't want to have those kind of conditions. And we are asking for, uh, uh, you know, with no condition, there should be an access, and we have the right to meet with the prisoners there, and we should know what are happening, and also the due process, and a fair trial should be put in, in, in that case. I'm like, yeah, very quick so one. Very quickly. Um, can I just add that, obviously, a prisoner 
is a person who's just tried his level best to kill you and failed and then asked for your clemency. So you've got to take that into perspective. It's easy to say that, in a sense, you know, basically, some people would argue that what they do to the prisoners in Bagram is torture. Other people might argue that it's a robust interview. <laughs> um, and those people are, not, they're not all fighters. I've seen people literally handed in by the Afghans, denounced, just in a sense of a tribal conflict Absolutely. or for political gain or personal gain. So they'll, they'll, they'll point the finger at somebody and those poor individuals end up in Bagram and in a long-term um, interrogation process. But I might add that the process in itself is invaluable because for those that aren't innocent people picked off up of the street, that are genuine fighters, um, they are highly trained, they're hard people, and only a long-term programme will ever get any intelligence out of them. One of the issues there is, is that sort of mass detention without trial yeah. is undemocratic. Absolutely. I agree, but bear in mind that under the Bond Agreement, every country had uh, a lead in what they were doing. For example, the British was counter-narcotics. The Italians are responsible for ju the judiciary. And ultimately, the Americans are responsible, <laughs> you know, for retraining the police force, which again they haven't oh, yes. done. They used so to ultimately, be, uh, yeah. the problem is it's disjointed. You might have prisoners, and don't get me wrong, no but, but most of the NATO countries don't want the prisoners. They would hand them over to the Afghans at a heartbeat. But the reality is, is the Afghans don't know what to do with them because there's no judicial system in place and there's nobody trained to deal with them, so they'll just let them go yeah, no, under, you know, an Afghan family no, agreement or whatever, repatriation. <laughs> so somebody's got to hold them. There are, there are all sorts of indications that atrocities that have taken place at the Bagram Detention Center and other detention centers run by the coalition around Afghanistan make Abu Ghraib look like summer camp where you would send your kids. All sorts of indications of this. This has never been properly investigated, and it needs to be investigated. But the biggest crime is the fact that hundreds, if if not thousands of people have been detained for years on end without access to a lawyer, without access to a judge. And that is in part because there hasn't been the, the effort to rebuild the judi judicial system hasn't been resourced. And furthermore, there is no agreed upon strategy by the various member nations of NATO of what to do about them in the meantime when there is no Afghan. So all of this comes back to the same basic issues. We have to resource this, uh, efforts to, to do some level of state building in <coughs> Afghanistan. So that, uh, and to protect the prosecutors and judges who would work in a court that would, that would try these people, because some of them definitely are bad guys. I agree with that. But at the same time, there has to be a, a, an agreed upon strategy. Do we need to have another bond summit? Or, or a, you know, so at some point, somebody's going to have to get serious about this problem. I'm eight years yeah, in. I Sorry, in I'm just going to cut it off. I'm going to have one last question. <laughs> you, madam, in the white hijab. Hi. Do you think if uh, sufficient troop numbers can't be mustered, it would actually be counterproductive, verging on dangerous to implement a plan like McChrystal's? Um, and if so, what are our military options, political options, with the numbers of troops that we have? Very, very quickly. Very Robert, good. You can can't do counterinsurgency light. Well, yeah. well, first of all, it's not just about numbers. In, in a sense, giving them extra troops is just presenting more targets. Before we moved into Helmand, we weren't getting shot at, oddly enough, except in Kabul. And when we she did the reconnaissance for that to move in, um, my boss came out from London and said, do you think we'll get attacked? Because it's been quiet for the Americans. I said, well, the Americans haven't left camp, and they're not burning people's livelihoods. And knowing the Brits as I do, I know they would turn up and be aggressive and dominate the ground. And oddly enough, they then got shot at and we've ended up with Helmand as it is today. But the other thing is, it's not just about putting troops in, it's about having the right troops. And jumping back to Bagram and tying this together, is the fact is, there are very few trained interrogators in any army. And a lot of the troops that do the mundane aspect of Bagram, guarding the prisoners, you know, all the administration, they're not trained for it, they're just spammed. And a lot of them are National Guardsmen. In Abu Ghraib, you had a lot of people their first time abroad and in charge of anyone else. They just got jiff for that. They weren't trained for it, which is why we ended up with the political nightmare, in the sense of PR nightmare, that was there. And the same applies to Bagram. It's all right having troops, and it's all right putting them on the ground, but they've got to be the right troops, and they've got to be correctly trained for the job that they're doing. Not just a case of putting a National Guardsman out of the back states of Tennessee and saying, guess what, you're a nuclear physicist. <laughs> Off you go. Because that's what I saw. Yeah. And people just got spammed for the job. And then, then they, they dropped the ball, and then people wonder why. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I've got to cut it off there. Um, I just want to thank uh, Horia, Robert, and uh, Gretchen for um, being members of this panel. And uh, I hope you've all found it worthwhile. Clearly, there's no easy solution to Afghanistan. My own personal feeling is that it's, you know, <laughs> Afghanistan does understand democracy. The Afghan people do understand democracy and that it isn't, by definition, a hopeless case. And I think we can all agree. I mean, what the, what the, the, the sort of take-home thesis from this, it seems to me, is that we jolly well need a strategy. And isn't it interesting, eight years on, that we're asking that? We elected them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.